fans, welcome to the most comprehensive 30 minutes in combat sports. This is Five Rounds. He is Robin Black. I am John Ramdeen, and we have a ton of stuff to get to coming up later in the show. We talk about some of the most controversial topics in combat sports, head injuries, PEDs, and all that other fun stuff, as Dr. Raymond from the University of Western Ontario joins us to give us his take on all things related to cheating. But we got to talk about guys that aren't cheating. Bellator 95 goes down on Thursday. Uh, one of the best fighters not in the UFC, Pat Curran, looks to defend his title against the hard-hitting Russian Shabalat Shamalayev. And it's going to be an exciting fight, Robin. And this is what Bellator needs. They've built their own talent, Pat Curran and Shamalayev. And I think that's what fans like. And you look at the momentum that these guys had. David Rickles versus Sadawad, 700 yeah. plus thousand people tuning in. The proof is in the pudding. Uh, fans love the product. Yeah, man. People are watching it. The fights are getting exciting every week, and they're just finding the right mix of young athletes, proven names, and those guys in the middle, those guys who are you know, a club fighter and sees this as their next big opportunity, or in some guys' cases, their last big opportunity. They're really getting it right. Yeah, you talk about the last big opportunity. Another fighter on the card, Doug, the former WEC light heavyweight champion, Doug the Rhino Marshall, taking on the hard-hitting Brett Cooper. This has fight of the night written all over it. Yeah, I mean, this ain't, this ain't complicated. There's no rocket surgery going on here. Two big, powerful heavy hitters are going to stand and square off, and maybe the best man may win. This is going to be a very tremendously exciting stand-up fight. What I like is that they're also building guys that, uh, you know, made their way through the tournament. Lyman Good, their former welterweight champion, the guy who lost to Ben Askren, also on the card. So they're trying to rebuild some of the guys that have lost in the past to prove that, look, we're not, once you lose, we're not kicking you out of the organization. We're here so that you can establish your career. And if people want to see a fight, the only way they can see that is by tuning into the Bellator product. And it's very similar to Rick Hahn. He lost to Michael Chandler. And who's not going to lose yeah. to Michael Chandler? Uh, most of the lightweights in the world. And an interesting story is he's taking on a fellow Judica, Carl Parisian. And if you've ever seen Carl Parisian fight, just go back, Google uh, Carl Parisian versus Nick Diaz or Diego Sanchez. You are not going to be disappointed. Uh, but we got to talk about Carl Parisian. This is a guy that left the sport of mixed martial arts because of substance abuse mm -hmm. problems and uh, his head just wasn't there. He seemed uh, mentally uh, not focused on the sport, and I think that could lead to a very dangerous path uh, if he steps inside of the cage and he's not mentally prepared. Yeah, and that's kind of this. We get into dicey territory here. These are great warriors in some of these guys' cases. Carl Parisian, like you said, has put on some of the great fights ever in that middle history period of the UFC. Who are we to say that this guy can't step up and do this for a living, continue his career? But at the same time, you know, you get a little bit nervous when you see these guys. He went through substance abuse problems. He lost a bunch of weight. He's not the same guy. You saw him, you know, get sort of unnerved even just signing autographs in the past. This is all documented. What do we do with a guy like this? You know, do we allow him as a great warrior who's earned his opportunity to do what he loves? Or do we make sure that we've got medical people, that we've got commissions testing him and making sure that that he is ready to fight. Yeah, and it's exactly that. Uh, you mentioned the MMA Expo, and he was signing a whole bunch of autographs, and then he had an anxiety attack, and I saw him in the back, and this did not seem like a fighter that was ready to face Matt Hughes yeah. for the welterweight championship of the world. This seemed like a very broken man, and as a matter of fact, Dr. Faisal Raymond, who will join us in the next segment, talked to Carl Parisian and said that this guy wasn't fit to fight. He had mental issues. And when we come back, we talk about all the fun things in mixed martial arts. Welcome back to Five Rounds, and joining us right now, Dr. Faisal Raymond, the Associate Chair of Medicine at Western University, and he was a doctor who has been involved in numerous combat sports events, including uh, the UFC. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we got to get right to the hot topic. Uh, TRT seems to be a problem in combat sports, and more specifically, in mixed martial arts. We know that the Nevada State Athletic Commission has a ratio, a tolerable ratio of six to one. But what does that actually mean? So John, uh, John and Robin, first of all, thanks a lot for having me on. I'm a big fan of both of yours. Um, the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio is um, something that I'll explain to you right now. Basically, um, epitestosterone and testosterone are both analogs of the same hormone. 
And when you are taking exogenous testosterone by injection or by tablet, um, your body stops making its own testosterone and stops making its own epitestosterone. So when you look at the ratio of testosterone to epitestosterone in people who are abusing testosterone, it is often high. And a normal value is probably close to 3 to 1. So anything above 3 to 1 is likely abnormal. And I think just to leave some room for error, you know, the World Anti-Doping uh, Agency has established 6 to 1 as the proper ratio. But that's kind uh, of double, indicating abuse. right? That's kind yeah. of double the it natural. Is. It is, absolutely. And I think that is a problem because there may be people with ratios of 4 to 1 or, right. or 3.5 to 1, for example, who but may be abusing. But uh, again, to try and make sure that there's no room for any um, uh, controversy, um, you know, they've established that ratio of 6 to 1. But there is room for error there in missing but people who are taking testosterone. The fact is that all of this stuff is subjective. You and I were having a conversation about it before, and it just comes down to the individual. I could go into my doctor and saying that, say that I don't feel very good, I feel tired, and, and those could play a factor when having your doctor prescribe certain things to you. So that's a great point. Um, as you know, there are a number of athletes who are taking testosterone who have medical clearance. And to me, it's a very vague and troubling area. Now, if you're a young kid, and you develop testosterone deficiency from a very young age, it becomes clinically very evident. You fail to develop secondary sexual characteristics. You know, you don't get proper pubic hair development, proper facial hair development, muscle development. And so to diagnose testosterone deficiency in a young kid is not difficult or less difficult. But in an adult, it's very vague. You know, I could have testosterone deficiency right now, and my only symptoms will be, you know, I'm a little bit tired and I lack some energy. So when athletes are going to their um, doc saying, you know what, I'm feeling a little tired and, and I'm feeling a little off, can you check my testosterone level? Well, that's a big uh, can of worms that you're opening up there. Yeah, and I mean, shouldn't you be <laughs> exhausted and having trouble sleeping and being tired all the time just because you're training for a fight? Exactly. I mean, these are very vague symptoms. Often these symptoms have multiple other explanations. And it's not unusual in that patients with these symptoms when they take extra testosterone that the symptoms don't get better. But in people who want to play the system a bit in order to get testosterone to enhance performance, that's where the problem is. Because they go in with these complaints. And strictly, you're supposed to check the testosterone level at 8 in the morning. Okay? If you check it at any other time, especially later in the day, it can drop by as much as 30%. Wow. And if docs who are ordering this test don't know that, they could interpret a normal level as being low. And then you're prescribing this medication to a, a, a patient who is using it for the wrong reasons. Let's crack this nut a little bit deeper here. We're talking about <laughs> testosterone replacement therapy. And really, in some ways, it's perceived to the average fan as just a way for guys to get a doctor to prescribe them something similar to a steroid that allows them to perform better and a way to get commissions to say it's okay. I mean, is this what we're looking at in a lot of cases? Unfortunately, I believe in some cases this is the case. Now, most doctors are very responsible. You know, they take a full history see what are the risk factors for this patient having testosterone deficiency. Were they exposed to certain medications? Were they exposed to certain diseases that can impair testes function yep. and decrease your testosterone production? Then they do a full physical exam looking for signs of testosterone deficiency. Um, and, and then they do the, the, the biochemical test. Uh, the biochemical test, if it borderline, needs to repeat it two or three times. So they do the proper job. The problem is, if someone's not well versed in this area, and they, they do the test, and, and the patient, instead of doing the test at 8 in the morning, does it at 8 at night yeah. or later in the, in the evening. You know, you could falsely label people as having testosterone deficiency. You give them the prescription, and they abuse it. And what about some of these athletes, you, for example, college wrestlers or high school wrestlers that start, you know, an athletic endeavor at a high level from the time they are 12 or 13 or even lower than that, saying 8 or 9 years old, take that into college and university, they've really been working as an athlete over those years. Would, the, would those type of athletes or those individuals, and I know it's case by case, but would they see a decrease of testosterone because they've been working so hard throughout their life? Great question, no. Um, strictly saying, you know, if they're, even if they're training hard from a very young age, their testosterone um, uh, secretion should be the same and, and should, they should not run into any, into any difficulties that way. What I worry about, though, if these young kids start taking exogenous testosterone or tes you know, injectable testosterone or oral testosterone supplements from a young age, they can cause testicular atrophy, which means shrinking of the testicles, and they can develop significant testosterone deficiency later in life. And the consequences of that 
So now all of a sudden we got a guy who was juicing when he was young, he gets a little bit older, and that causes him to have low test, goes to see his doctor, and his doctor says, here, you're on TRT. And all of a sudden we have a guy who's been using juice through much of his life, getting it prescribed for him now. Absolutely. You hit it right on the nail there. And uh, so, I mean, if we look even a little bit deeper here, how does this kind of, like, like lay out with just stri strictly steroid abuse. Is this just a simpler way for a lot of guys to abuse steroids? And what's the real, what's the real risk of steroid abuse in okay. the sport? So, you know, steroids are essentially analogs to testosterone, okay? So the consequences of taking uh, or abusing steroids uh, are the same as the consequences of abusing testosterone. And those consequences are testicular atrophy, impotence, sexual dysfunction. Man, this sounds and, bad. <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of other potential side effects that are, are being linked to steroids, as you all know. Although the links are not strong and there is some controversy, personality changes, yeah. violence, you know, enlargement of the heart, there are other consequences of these medications that are, are concerning. And believe it or not, uh, gynecomastia, which is enlargening of the breasts, is also a side effect of testosterone that you don't think about. Okay, let me get this straight. I take some juice, I can't have sex, my nuts shrink, I grow some boobs, uh, lose some hair. In a lot of cases, what we're looking at is people who want this, this desire to win so bad are willing to take these giant risks. We almost kind of kind of look at the motivation and what it means to be this driven of an athlete. I mean, that, and we've talked about this before. I'm on steroids, say, and John has to fight me. What would you do? Yeah, I would have to take steroids. I mean, that's, if, I know that if I want to compete with you at that level, I have to do it. I have no choice because, you know, the, the playing field is not leveled. Uh, my question I, I have to ask, are what are the advantages when some of these athletes take TRT why are they taking it? There's no doubt that TRT and some of the synthetic steroids do increase muscle mass, do increase power, do increase your athletic performance. Your so there is no doubt, there is no doubt that taking these uh, supplements, um, illegal substances, do enhance your performance and give you an unfair advantage over your opponent. There is no doubt about that. These medications have been shown to enhance performance. You go back way back to the 1936 Olympics. You know, the German swimming team, the German women's swimming team comes to the Olympics speaking in deep voices and with uh, the muscular builds of, of bodybuilder men. So, and, and, and they won most of the medals at that, uh, at that games. So this has been going on for a long time. There is no doubt that testosterone and its analogs improve athletic performance. Now we've heard BJ Penn in the past saying that he doesn't like fighting against guys that have steroids because they have a physical ad advantage and they can do damage. And I have to ask you that if I'm a guy that's 225 pounds and I throw a punch in an at an opponent without using steroids and then I take steroids, am I going to do more damage to my opponent head doing, uh, causing head trauma or just uh, physical damage opposed to if I wasn't on steroids? Absolutely that potential exists. And you, know, you can imagine you're, you could potentially increase your power by 20 or 30 percent. And you know if you're, if, um, if you're inflicting that on your opponent, you're putting your opponent at higher risk of, of, of head injury and, and, and other injuries. So absolutely, I think that uh, testosterone, synthetic steroids give unfair advantages to the athletes using them and put the opponent at risk of bodily harm. Now, now, guys, you know, we've heard, you know, we have TRT is something that's really, you know, being talked about a lot right now. We've also heard a lot about guys who find a way to cheat. But, I mean, what can we even do about this at this point? The Lance Armstrong world, in, in his world, it was cultural. Everybody was doing it. What do we do to make sure that fighting, if it isn't now, doesn't become that way? You know, the athletes at this point that abuse these medications are ahead of the game. Okay. It has become a street science. It is incredible how, how much science these guys have learned uh, from experimenting with these medications over decades. Okay. So the, the, since the early 1900s, perhaps, uh, people have been uh, abusing these, these types of medications. And there are various ways now athletes have gotten around it. Um, a number of the athletes abuse these substances by stacking them and permitting them. So they're taking oral and injectable supplements early on in their training. And then as the fight draws closer, they start tapering off until before the fight, they taper themselves completely off. They still have the benefit of the muscle development from those medications and they're able to perform. And by the time the drug testing is done, it is negative. How do we beat this? Like how do we, how can you stop this when that's the case? So there are a number of strategies you need to develop. I just want to give you another example though of, of how crazy this has become. So one of the th tests you mentioned right up in the get-go is measuring the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio in the urine, which is a way of detecting if people are taking extra testosterone. 
Well, um, what's happened is people are, have, have now isolated epitestosterone and are injecting that into them. Wow. Epitestosterone gives you no benefit. <laughs> it doesn't help you with muscle okay. development, but it makes your ratio in your urine normal. Wow, And crazy. so you now all of a sudden have fooled the test. Other things people are doing to get around it is they are taking diuretics. So when you take a diuretic, which is a medication that helps you pee more salt and water, uh, like Lasix is a common one that, that, that's abused, um, it dilutes out everything in the urine. So you can't measure the hormone levels properly because it's diluted out. Plasma expanders. These are, medi these are intravenous solutions that you infuse into your body that dilute everything in your blood so much that you can't detect it. Uh, it's just crazy what Man. people are doing to get around it. And the only way to answer your question, the only way around it is number one, do more sporadic testing. Yeah. And number two is um, uh, to, uh, one of the things they've started doing in cycling this is mainly for EPO doping though, is taking a biologic passport. So what you do is you take your athlete at baseline, you take a blood sample, and you get all of the biochemistry and the red blood cell mass and everything from that sample. And then if there's any significant variation when it's checked after that, um, you know, you'll get, you'll get caught for, this is mainly for EPO dose wow. doping where you're trying to make your red blood cells high. And so that's, that, that has become very effective. Even Lance Armstrong himself, said that if they were using the biologic passport from the get-go, he would never have been able to do auto transfusions of blood or to use EPO doping. When we come back, we are talking about more controversial subje subjects, including head injuries here on Five Rounds. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Five Rounds. John Ramdeen and Robin Black alongside Dr. Faisal Raymond. Uh, we're talking about some controversial subjects and one of those topics uh, that's kind of in the forefront of mixed martial arts right now is head injuries. Uh, uh, Robin Nick Denis, uh, one of your guys, recently retired from mixed martial arts. Uh, because of that reason, uh, we know a lot of other fighters are c contemplating it because, uh, you know, just sustaining too much damage. And the question has to be asked, does that damage happen in the fight? Or does it happen in the training room? And it, most likely it's the training room. Can't you agree? Absolutely, absolutely. I think um, uh, head trauma in, in combat sports is a serious problem. Although I do want to say this is not uh, only related to, to combat sports. We, I've seen more, much more serious head injuries in hockey. Of course. Much more serious head injuries in American football. Yeah. Much more serious head injuries in soccer. So for those of you who, who don't like combat sports because of uh, head injuries, uh, I think that's uh, not fair. Yeah, I think in a lot of cases, people may not like something, they don't like something else about it, and they'll find ways to make a more palatable argument. So they'll say, oh, well, you know, it's too dangerous. But this sport is no more dangerous than those sports you mentioned, or Alaskan king cat crab fishing, or being a firefighter, or any other things that you, any other it, It's just not everybody's cup of tea, and we, we can all accept yep. that. I mean, to, to, but like, exactly to your point, uh, it's just as dangerous as hockey or football. And let's just get that yep. out of the way and just talk about the, the serious injuries Absolutely. and why people uh, continue to chase this dream when we know that head injuries and uh, quality of life could change. Certainly, and head injury in any sport is a serious issue and in combat sports, we should take measures to try and reduce that, you know, and try to make the sport safer. Absolutely, especially for our young kids entering into the amateurs. Um, I would completely agree with you. I think the vast majority of head injuries I'm seeing as a ringside doctor, when I review the medical port reports and look at the MRIs and look at the neurologic testing, is from athletes um, training very hard in the gym. And hard sparring has probably damaged more athletes than anything else or any damage they've, they've uh, received in, in, in the fight itself. Now, obviously, you can still get traumatic brain injury in a, in a major fight. People have died in major fights, in boxing fights. We've seen that. But um, the, the most common way our athletes are exposed to uh, head injury is because of training hard in the gym. The hard sparring, the old shoe two type sparring where they, they leave it all in the gym, very, very dangerous. And I think what I've noticed in a number of the uh, MMA gyms is they're, they're adjusting to that. You know, fighters aren't necessarily killing themselves in the ring or yeah. sparring hard, as hard as they used yeah. to. And I think that's a good sign. You know, uh, the American uh, Association of Neurology just released something, and they talked about, they examined hundreds of fighters, 
and they found, you know, the reason I bring this up is, yes, we agree that this isn't the most dangerous thing in the world, but it's still valuable for people who want to go through this, you know, compete in the sport and, you know, critics of the sport to really know the actual risks. And, and the neurosurgery uh, release just came out and said that after, you know, 10, 15 years of fighting, we saw shrinkage in the caudate part of the brain as well as the amygdala, both which affect memory, learning, and uh, emotional response. So is that something that you really, how can you make sure that we monitor athletes so that we don't see that happen as they get older? Great question. I just want to echo exactly what you're saying. The athletes that run into trouble are the young kids who start boxing, let's say at age 15, and you know what, by the time they're in their mid-30s, late-30s, if they've suffered a lot of, of brain trauma, they're starting to, sh to show the clinical sequelae of recurrent head injury. And I think the best way to monitor for this, first of all, is to probably start neuro -like, neuropsychological testing and psychometric testing early on, get a baseline result, and follow them serially over mm. the years. The main problem with that is that these tests are very expensive. You know, it's about $2,000 for me to arrange uh, neuropsychological testing for an athlete, and that's not covered by OHIP, okay, wow. or by healthcare. Yeah. So um, uh, that's a big issue. That's the monitoring issue. The second issue is we need to follow these patients longitudinally to see what in their training pattern predicts um, uh, their chances of getting uh, signs of encephalopathy or brain damage from fighting. Um, is it the amount of sparring they do? You know? Is it the amount of weight they cut? We know from studies in boxing that the degree of weight cutting puts you at much higher, the higher the degree of weight cutting, the higher the risk mm. of getting an intracranial hemorrhage or bleeding in your brain from a punch. So is it the weight cutting? Is it the amount of sparring, the hard sparring they're doing? What's putting them, uh, them at risk? And uh, until we do that study properly, we're not going to be able to take measures. I think one of the things I'm fully supportive of is cutting back the amount of sparring you're doing mm -hmm. in preparation for a fight. I think that's dangerous. And I think fighters are also um, under realizing that when they're seeing their, their colleagues run into difficulty. Well, clearly, uh, it comes down to awareness. A lot of these fighters have to know that they have to ease up inside of the gym. And I want to thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Faisal Raymond and my good friend, Mr. Robin Black. We want to thank you so much for watching Five Rounds. I'm John Ramdeen saying so long. We'll see you next time.